Have you ever wondered how psychopathic you are? How do you compare to Ted Bundy, Aileen Warnos, Jeffrey Dahmer, and Ed Kemper? How do you compare to the average person? If you've ever asked those questions, then this is the video for you. There is a certain fascination with the taboo in us all. This extends to interest in transgressive acts and transgressors. One of the greatest social transgressions is murder, and the pinnacle of those who kill are psychopathic serial killers. Individuals so different from the rest of us that they may as well be a different species, sharks in human form, doing whatever they feel is necessary, whenever they feel it necessary, no matter the cost to others. In this video, we will explore the Hair Psychopathy Checklist, which has entered public consciousness via fictionalized television shows and true crime documentaries. Before we start, we should clarify one very important item. Psychopathy is not the same as a diagnosis of Antisocial Personality Disorder, ASPD. Antisocial Personality Disorder is a psychiatric diagnosis in the ICD-10 International Statistical Classification of Disease, which can be made on the basis of the patient fulfilling at least three of the following. 1. Callous unconcern for the feelings of others. 2. Gross and persistent attitude of irresponsibility and disregard for social norms, rules, and obligations. 3. Incapacity to maintain enduring relationships, though having no difficulty in establishing transient relationships. 4. Very low tolerance to frustration and a low threshold for discharge of aggression, including violence. 5. Incapacity to experience guilt or to profit from experience, particularly punishment. 6. Marked readiness to blame others or to offer plausible rationalizations for the behavior that has brought the person into conflict with society. Only after establishing three or more of these six criteria can ASPD be formally diagnosed. Psychopathy is not a diagnosis found in either the ICD-10 or the American Psychiatric Association's Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, the DSM-5. Rather, it is a constellation of traits which are assessed using a combination of 1. A semi-structured interview. 2. A review of the subject's psychiatric and legal history. The most well-known method of evaluating psychopathy is Robert Hare's Psychopathy Checklist. During the course of the interview and review of the patient's notes, whenever they meet a criterion on the checklist, it is ticked off. At the end of the interview and review, the number of items ticked off is totaled up to give the hair psychopathy checklist score. This is often referred to as the PCL, psychopathy checklist, or PCLR, psychopathy checklist revised score. In order for the PCLR tool to be valid, it must 1 be administered by a clinician specifically trained in how to administer the tool. Insufficient training has been shown to result in incorrect scoring. 2. Be administered by an experienced assessor. The greater their level of psychiatric or psychological and forensic experience, the better. An element of comparing to normal behavior and judging how aberrant a behavior truly is, is necessary for accurate scoring of the PCLR. So the more experienced the clinician, the more accurate such judgment is likely to be, all other things being equal. 3. Comprise both a semi-structured interview as well as a review of the subject's psychiatric and legal notes. This means that any self-administered hair's psychopathy checklist is, by definition, invalid. The checklist comprises two broad categories of questions. Category 1. Investigating selfishness, callous abuse of others, interpersonal relationships, and affect. Category 2. Investigating antisocial, impulsive, and deviant behaviors. Let's examine the 20 traits assessed by the PCLR now. 1. Glib and superficial charm. They are superficially charming, smooth talkers. 2. Large egos. They consider themselves superior to others. 3. Prone to boredom. They constantly seek stimulating activities. 4. Pathological lying. They are expert, practiced liars and will lie even when the truth is obvious. 5. Conning and manipulative. They cheat, deceive, and manipulate as easily as you or I breathe. If it gets them what they want, then anything said or done is justified in their eyes. 6. Lack of remorse or guilt. They may pretend remorse or guilt in order to blend into society or to receive a lesser sentence, but they don't experience either deeply. 7. Superficial emotions. They don't feel things deeply. They may appear friendly, but that friendliness is skin deep and can't be relied on if inconvenient to them. 
8. Callousness and lack of empathy. They have a lack of care towards others, often appearing as heartlessness, indifference, and tactlessness. 9. Parasitic lifestyle. They are often poorly motivated, lack self-discipline, and happy to take no responsibility for earning their own living so leech off others. I frequently find psychopaths in relationships with caring but emotionally vulnerable individuals whom they leech off. If the partner ever stops being able to support the psychopath, they'll move on to another victim to leech off without a second thought. 10. Sexual promiscuity. People serve needs. 11. Poor behavioral control. They frequently exhibit outbursts of annoyance, anger when needs are unmet. Meet that need or else that's how a psychopath thinks. Consequently, they have many flings when single, affairs when married, and may even maintain multiple relationships at the same time, sometimes known to their partners, sometimes unknown. 12. Early behavioral issues. They frequently have significant behavioral issues as teenagers, including stealing, vandalism, truancy, substance abuse, fire setting, and cruelty to animals and siblings or other children. Fire setting and cruelty to animals and siblings are indicative of a poor prognosis in adulthood. 13. Lack of realistic long-term goals. They talk big but deliver little. And it is never their fault. Some external factor always prevented them from achieving the unrealistic goals they put little work into achieving. They're the definition of if only. 14. Impulsivity. They frequently act without premeditation and planning. There is often little ability to delay gratification, resist temptation, or consider the consequences. 15. Irresponsibility. They repeatedly fail to meet commitments and social, school, or work obligations. 16. Failure to accept responsibility for their own actions. In psychiatric terms, we call this an external locus of responsibility. They aren't responsible for what they did, and they only did it because this external force acted on them in such a way that anyone would have done the same thing. It is the external force's fault, really. 17. Many short-term relationships. If they do have relationships, these relationships rarely last. Once their partner's usefulness ends, then the relationship ends. 18. Juvenile delinquency. Behavioral difficulties as a teenager. Many teenagers have all sorts of boundary-pushing and authority-challenging behavior, but the juvenile psychopath's behaviors will generally be more callous, manipulative, and aggressive in character. 19. Revocation of conditional release. They will frequently have had previous probations revoked. 20. Criminal versatility. Many criminals specialize in a certain type of crime, burglary, drug dealing, car theft, etc., Psychopaths will engage in any crime that is expedient. Many of the psychopaths I have reviewed will, when describing serious assaults and murders they have committed, state that the victim deserved what they got because of something the victim said or did. They believe that obviates them of any responsibility. I recently had a psychopath relate an incident to me whereby he attempted to run over his girlfriend at the time, now ex-girlfriend, obviously. She had upset him by picking a fight with him earlier in the evening. His view was that if she didn't want to be run over by a car twice, then she shouldn't have picked the fight. He felt that since she had started it, his actions were provoked and justified. Additionally, he argued that he only attempted to run her over twice because she had provoked him so much, and that if she hadn't been so annoying earlier in the evening, he wouldn't have reversed over her after hitting her the first time. Not only were the assaults her fault— but their severity was her fault, too. He felt he behaved as anyone else would have, given these outrageous provocations on her part. There was no element of remorse. In fact, when I pointed out that if she hadn't jumped out of the way when he tried to reverse over her the second time, he would have been facing a murder charge instead of attempted murder. He replied that he was glad she jumped out of the way. This wasn't because she hadn't died, but because this meant he was facing a less serious charge. This is how psychopaths think. If you are enjoying this video and want to let us know you want to see more videos like this, hit the like button. So, let's look at the sorts of assessments clinicians make when scoring the Hare's Psychopathy Checklist by scoring your responses to 20 questions. Get a pen and paper, and for each of the following questions, write down zero if you feel this does not apply, one if this applies sometimes, and two if this applies almost always.
I've included a link in the description to a PDF version of the checklist for you to print and score yourselves. So, remember, zero equals definitely not, one equals sometimes, and two equals definitely. So, one, are you superficially charming but unmoved beneath the surface? Two, do you have an excessive sense of self-worth or self-confidence? Three, are you prone to boredom and frequently feel the need to seek out new experiences which are either physically or psychologically stimulating? Four, do you lie easily and frequently? Five, do you frequently manipulate others to achieve your own goals? Six, do you feel no remorse or guilt for your actions even if they intentionally or unintentionally harm others? Seven, do you feel less emotion than others exhibit in similar circumstances? 8. Do you feel less empathy and appear less tactful than others? 9. Are you happy to have your lifestyle supported by others without reciprocation? 10. Do you frequently experience sudden and extreme bouts of annoyance, anger, verbal, and physical abuse? 11. Are you more promiscuous than others? 12. Did you have behavioral issues as a child or teenager? 13. Do you have a history of setting unrealistic life goals which you fail to achieve? 14. Are you impulsive with difficulty delaying gratification or resisting temptation? 15. Do you often fail to meet personal, work, or social obligations? 16. Do you often rationalize your negative actions by putting the blame on others or external factors? 17. Do you find difficulty maintaining long-term relationships? 18. Did you get into excessive trouble as a child or teenager? 19. Have you ever had your probation revoked? 20. Have you knowingly broken a wide variety of laws in the past? Now, add up all of your scores to get a number between 0 and 40. So what did you score? Leave the number in the comments below and let's get a sense of how psychopathic the average YouTuber viewing this video is. So what does your score mean? How psychopathic are you? The minimum score is 0 and the maximum score is 40. In the United States, just over 1% of the general population will score 30 or over on the checklist. Most online sources which discuss the hair psychopathy checklist say that 30 is the cutoff for psychopathy. This is not strictly correct as the distribution of scores for the checklist varies from society to society. For example, in the United States, anyone with a score of 30 or over is considered a psychopath. But in the United Kingdom, the cutoff for psychopathy is 25. This mirrors a difference in checklist scores among prisoners in these two countries. The average checklist score among prisoners in the United States being 22, while the average among prisoners in the United Kingdom is 17. Roughly 20% of prisoners in the United States score over 30. In both countries, the average checklist score among the general population is between 4 and 6. Check out this graph showing the percentage of psychopaths among a sample of 203 corporate professionals. As you can see, roughly 4% of corporate professionals in this study scored above 30, the cutoff for psychopathy in the United States. Note the fact that the vast majority, over 80%, scored 4 or less, and that the numbers scoring more than 4 tended to tail off all the way up to 34. Interestingly, Certain professions seem to be attractive to psychopaths. These tend to be professions in which one accrues power and influence, which reward superficial charisma and manipulation. Take a second to guess what some of them might be. Kevin Dutton, a British psychologist who has published on psychopaths, states that their top four career choices are 1. CEO 2. Attorney 3. Media personality 4. Salesperson Did you guess any of those? Can you think of other professions which psychopaths might gravitate toward? If so, let us know in the comments. What do higher scores mean in terms of criminal risk? As previously mentioned, the average score among prisoners in the U.S. is 22. But this doesn't mean that there is some magical cutoff above which a checklist score predicts incarceration and below which the individual lives a saintly existence. There are people with scores of 30 walking freely among us and many people in prisons with scores of 5. However, the higher the score, the more likely an individual is to engage in criminal activity and the more likely those criminal activities are to be callous and harmful to others. We can see this reflected in the scores of several infamous serial killers. Ted Bundy, 39 out of 40. Clifford Olson, 38 out of 40. Paul Bernardo, 38 out of 40. 
Aileen Warnos, 32 out of 40. Some other scores are surprising. Jeffrey Dahmer, 23 out of 40. Ed Kemper, 20 out of 40. Higher scores among prisoners are associated with higher rates of drug abuse, repeated incarceration, prisoners requiring higher security prisons, and ill-disciplined behavior in prison. Perpetrators of domestic violence also have high rates of psychopathy, 15 to 30 percent, particularly associated with high PCLR Factor I scores emotional deficits, callous and exploitative interpersonal style. I hope you found this exploration of the revised hair psychopathy checklist interesting, and it has helped clear up some of the many misconceptions out there about this useful tool. We've included links in the description to books by Kevin Dutton exploring the positive aspects of psychopathy and John Ronson's The Psychopath Test. These are affiliate links, so if you purchase a book through them, we'll receive a commission which we'll put toward creating more and better content. Please leave any comments or questions in the comments section, and we'll do our best to answer them. This channel is dedicated to exploring mental health, human psychology, psychiatry, and interesting clinical and forensic cases. If you'd like to be notified when we release videos, remember to subscribe and hit the bell icon. Take care and stay safe.